thank you, Katie, for the introduction, and thank you, Dev, for um, giving me the invitation to speak here. Um, I, as as Katie said, um, I'm my research area is complex systems, um, and what that means for projects like this is I'm interested in, as the title here succinctly says, um, building models from data where I'm chiefly interested in what the models can tell us about the deterministic dynamics that's going on in the system. So um, I usually take the view that the stochastic stuff is um, an annoyance, which is somehow driving the model, but the model itself is deterministic. So um, there's a whole bunch of people that have done all the work behind this. Um, so a lot of the ideas go back to my own PhD sometime last millennium, um, and that was with Kevin and Alistair, um, Dave, Thomas, Deborah, A.M., other Thomas, Shannon, um, uh, colleagues in the Department of Mathematics Statistics, or were, that have been working on some of these ideas, and Eugene and Braden, uh, the uh, slaves, I mean, um, PhD students that did all the hard work, and Melinda is the engineer that uh, kept us honest when it comes to the applications, which I'll talk a bit about later on in the talk. So let me start with um, kind of my view of what the purpose of modeling is and what we're trying to get out of building models from data. So there'll be quite a bit of text and equations on a few of these slides. Most of it can be um, happily and gainfully ignored. Um, the key part here is simply that I've got some set of observations. These are my ZTs. So I'm measuring um, as a time series, a set of states of my system. And I want to build a model that tells me what the future behavior of that system is. So to do that, I can drive the model with a history of previous observations and use that to predict the future observations. So that's simply the F that you see here. I'm seeking a function, deterministic function of the past D observations, F Z T minus one to Z T minus D, that give me approximately a prediction of the next observation, Z T. And the way that almost everyone goes about doing this is that we will seek a function which minimizes the root mean square prediction error. So the deviations between the model prediction, F of the state and the true state, we seek to have minimum error, minimum deviation between those two things. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that we get a good model. So what makes a model good depends on what we hope to do with it. So here I have a um, simple toy example. Um, this is an artificial system. It's a two-dimensional chaotic map called the Tinkerbell map. Um, I like it because it's pretty and it's got a funny name. And I've taken 10,000 points from this. So start with my observation in two dimensions and iterate it forward 10,000 time steps. And what you're seeing on the left are my observations of those 10,000 pairs XT and YT, the 10,000 states of that system. This is the truth about that system. Um, I've added some noise here because even though I'm interested in the deterministic part, we, we know that there is noise and they're gonna have to deal with it. So I've just added uh, Gaussian uncertainty in those two dimensions to my XTs and YTs, and that gives me a fuzzy approximation to the deterministic Tinkerbell map. So on the left, I'm plotting the states, XT versus YT. On the right, I'm plotting the time series of just XT. So what I'm seeking to do when I build a model is simply by measuring the XTs, build some which approximates both XT and YT. So I can do that. I can use a technique, which I'm not gonna talk about right now to build such a model. And on the left here, you can see the blue line is the true time series. That's true XT versus T of that Tinkerbell map. The red ones are my predictions, which look pretty good. They're pretty close to the real ones. The green things are the errors. Um, 
But the predictions here are just one step predictions. So at each point, I know the truth at time t, and I'm trying to predict xt plus one. So the fact that the errors are quite small is because I've minimized the root mean square prediction error, but it doesn't necessarily tell me about how well that model is going to work as a model of reality. What do I mean by model of reality? That means I want to take those predictions and iterate them. I want to use the model to actually make my predictive system. So that's what I'm showing on the right. On the right, you can see the, the blue noisy points that were my true data, xt versus in this case, xt plus one, um, because I don't actually have access to yt. So I'm just using xt and xt plus one of the truth. And I've then taken a particular random initial point on that from that blue cloud, iterated it with the model. So I've taken that truth with the model, applied the model over and over and over again to it. And I get a sequence of points, each one predicted from the previous prediction. And that is the model, what I'm calling the model simulation. And if I plot that sequence of successive model XT, XT plus ones, you can see that even though on the left, I've got a model which has small error and looks like it captures the immediate short-term dynamics. If I try to iterate it, the iterated predictions are really quite bad. Um, here is one I prepared earlier. Um, you can see this one, the errors are similarly small. There's not too much difference between the errors in these two models. But the second one, if I iterate that one true initial state many times, and I plot those points in a color I'm gonna call orange on the right, then it doesn't match the truth of the Tinkerbell map exactly, but it's a lot closer. It's got a lot of the features. And I would argue that because it hasn't actually got noise in it, it's actually um, interior to the cloud of points that the model was built from. So the takeaway message at this point is simply root mean square prediction error is not great if you want to try and necessarily get a good simulation of your system, get a good model that can simulate the truth of your behavior. This, of course, is nothing particularly new or novel. Um, these ideas have been about for a long time. Um, I'm going to skip over this stuff. Essentially, all I'm saying here is that I can write down my model approximation as a series of matrix equations. So my current predicted states here shows vertical columns of the matrix inside F on the left. Ah, sorry, horizontal. So each state is shown as a as a row of this. So the first state is ZD, ZD minus one to Z1. That's the D-dimensional vector. And I've got a succession of these through the time series from one to N, uh, um, which I'm trying to make a succession of predictions, the Z D plus one to D plus N. And I've got a vector of errors. And we're trying to, as usual, minimize those errors. Um, in fact, what I was showing you earlier the model that was being produced there was using a regularization technique called minimum description length. So that the model that was being produced is the most compact description of this, of this data. So what that means is that obviously when you build a model, you've got many, many choices to what that model looks like. The model that I'm using, and again, the equations here are just to provide something for everyone. If equations are not your thing, then um, just keep listening and I'll talk through them. If equations are your thing, then um, by all means, go berserk. Um, the, the, the particular form of function I'm fitting from those examples I showed you, there was a radial basis function. So that's the sum of these basis. That's the first equation at the top here where we've got um, f of x being some comp a sum of lambda j phi j's, where each of those phi j's is a basis function. Um, these basis functions have parameters. Those are the c j's and the r j's that we have to somehow fit. All that's nonlinear and complicated. And then there's weights that go on the top front of this. These are the lambda j's. We at least know how to do that because it's linear. Um, and we have a complication that we are not constrained into how many of these things that we want to put in our model. If we add more of them, 
the model will get better and better and better and better in that the I can just add more parameters and the model prediction error goes down. This is standard overfitting. We are avoiding that in the context of what I'm talking about here by using the concept of description length, which is essentially two things you need to know about description length for the current talk. The first is it's computable. That is, I can actually calculate it. That's what the second equation is showing, that second not very nice equation. Um, the second thing is that description length is an approximation to the cost of, of describing the data by describing the model. The cost of describing the data by describing the model. What that means is I have the model, the, the data, and I could describe to you each of those observations, Z1 through to Zn, by telling you each of those numbers. Or I could give you the formulation of my model, the parameters of that model, and the errors that the model makes in making those predictions. All right, so I don't tell you all the true data values, I just tell you, here's the first half dozen numbers, use this model described by these numbers, make the predictions, and then look at the errors, which I'm going to tell you. If it's a good model, then the description of the model by and the model prediction errors will be more compact than simply describing the data. And that's what description X is calculating. There's various alternatives for regularization. So for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't really matter that I'm using description length, just that that's my favorite tool. Um, you can use whatever technique you want. And when you do that, you get a compact model where the terms in the model hopefully are capturing meaningful deterministic dynamics of the original system. So we can apply this idea um, and you'll see here a paper from 20 plus years ago. Um, here, we've applied exactly this idea to build a model of the Lorenz, Lorenz equations. Doesn't matter what the Lorenz equations are, it's a system of ordinary differential equations. Um, three variables, X, Y, and Z. The right-hand side of those ordinary differential equations is polynomial. So that means X dot is equal to some polynomial terms, y dot is equal to some polynomial terms, z dot is equal to some polynomial terms. And we seek a model that reconstructs those equations through reconstructing the dynamics. And I'm now looking for models where the terms in the model are themselves polynomial. So you can see here listed the terms for the x, y, and z components. That's the various combinations of x, y's, and z's. Uh, and in each case, the model regularized with description length as its model fitting criteria has determined the coefficients of each of those terms. So for example, it's saying that x dot is equal to xz times 1.5 by 10 to the minus 13 plus yz times 4.3 by 10 to the minus 13 plus 10 times y, minus 10 times x, plus 8.5 times 10 to the minus 14 times x, y, and so on. The reason I'm showing you this is because if you ignore all those terms that, have, um, that are very, very small, what you're left with, x dot equals 10 y minus x, y dot equals minus y minus x, z plus x, and z dot equals x, y minus eight thirds z is exactly what we expect for the actual Lorenz equation. So the model, by looking at the data, fitting these terms, applying regularization is able to extract the actual underlying dynamics of the system. So that's kind of neat. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment. People are doing this with um, more sophisticated techniques, bigger computers, more data, and using machine learning to uncover physics is, is what people are talking about claiming that this is doing so the idea is that you apply your machine learning learning you apply your model fitting process to the data to extract the equations just as we've done here and then the equations are then the physical laws that you're trying to learn trying to uncover so it's not a terribly novel idea 
but it's a neat way of exploiting the, um, the power of computers these days and larger data sets. So where am I going with this for the purposes of today's talk? Well, we still have a big problem here in that I can fit my models to the data. My fitting criteria is root mean square prediction error, but I don't have a good way of assessing whether my model is a good model for a particular system. So uh, one way that you might think about assessing this is by looking at ensemble predictions. So these are some ensemble predictions for the Lorenz system, again, from that 21 year old paper. Um, so you can see, <coughs> first of all, that in 2002, journals didn't like using color. Um, second of all, you can see the solid three solid lines are the predicted mean and predicted standard deviation. So that's the envelope of predictions um, versus a particular prediction in the dot dash, the truth in the dotted, and the, well, the model, things I'm using to build the model from are forward predictions, which are the asterisks. So you can do this. You can, you can ask how well does the model as an ensemble make predictions? But what I'm more interested in is trying to um, skip forward 20 odd years and, <coughs> excuse me, assess the models by looking at how well the shape of the predicted attractors, the shape of the dynamics matches the that we've got from the original data. And this is the original idea that I showed back with this picture here, where I'm claiming that this is a good model because when I plot my sequence of simulated observations, XT versus XT plus ones, as a cloud of points and compare them to the actual observations I started with, they have objects that are the same shape. So the question, of course, is how do I decide whether two objects are the same shape? And so, that's what we're focusing on here. We're using a technique called persistent homology, um, which essentially is a data intensive method for quantifying the shape of clouds of points. Okay. Um, and so we can apply this measure both to the true data and to the model simulations. If the model simulations have the same shape as the true data, then we claim we've got a good model and we're happy if the model simulations have a shape that deviates from the true the shape of the true data then we have at least learned something about where the models are failing to capture the structure of the dynamics so how does it all work well there's an awful lot going on on the slide let me just summarize it quickly um, i want to construct the, the homology, the topology of my cloud of point, of my attractor from a cloud of points. Now, obviously a cloud of points is just a cloud of points. There's no topology there, but there's, there's, no, there's no shape. It's just a finite set of points. However, if we plot those points in 3D space and look at them, we can see shape, we can see structure. So we want a, the computational method to extract that shape and that structure. And the way in which it works is illustrated with the four panels at the top left with the uh, blue circles. I put a small ball, each of the blue circles, around each of my data points. And then I make those circles get bigger and bigger and bigger from left to right. When the circles intersect, as in the second panel, they first do for the two points at the top, then I say that those two points are connected by a line. All right, so for the second panel from the top left, I've got one, two, three, four, five isolated points and two points that are connected. Keep growing those circles. In the third panel from the top right, uh, from the top left, sorry. I've now got each of those points connected to its neighbors forming a ring. Keep growing the circles further and that ring becomes a solid tetrahedron as each of those points is connected to each of the other points. Right? So I now have a, a simplex where each of the points is connected to every other point in, in a solid configuration. So we understand the structure of the cloud of points 
it's by looking at the structure of the connections as we increase the size of those balls. So this is all encapsulated in the persistence diagram in the bottom left-hand corner. So what the persistence diagram on the horizontal and vertical axis is showing is the radius of balls at which each of those structures I flagged, the connections, first appears, and at which point they disappear. So as I, it's, there's, a, there's a critical value of epsilon where those two balls in the second panel at the top left are first connected, increase epsilon further, and as additional things come into that structure, that initial pairwise connection is lost in preference for a larger shape. So the dots in the persistence diagram capture the birth and death of each of those structures. And importantly, although it has, doesn't come out in the way I've explained this, the, 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 the key feature that we're looking at here is not so much the solid shapes, but the holes that emerge in the ring. So the, the ring structure has an empty void in the middle of it, and it's voids like that that we're looking for to capture the the structure of the dynamics. These voids being, if I flick back to here, what we expect to see as the holes in the shape of the structure. Okay. From the persistence diagram on the left, we essentially, um, for reasons that are mostly um, technical and not all that interesting, we rotate that through 45 degrees and sum up all those things and we get the persistent landscape. And we can get an ensemble of these persistence landscapes as we compare different realizations of both the, from the data and the model simulations. And we get a, a mean of those expected values. And we look at how far that mean lies from the corresponding landscape for the true data. So encapsulating everything that I've said, we've got some shape in our cloud of points, which is the dynamics of our system. We measure the way in which those points form clusters and holes for the true data and for the simulation. And we look at the deviation between those two things. And that's what's shown for four different models down the right-hand side. The measure, which is indicated on this, the far right panel with C, uh, I can't even read what the subscript is, but C bar and C is the conformance, right? So conformance of one means very good agreement between the model and the simulation, the, the model and the data. For different values of, well, it's a combination of birth and death, but it's essentially the scale that we're looking at this thing at. So if we see high conformance across all scales that's saying that the model and the simulation agree at all possible scales where we see large disagreement at some particular scales that's telling us where those two things disagree okay so that's a long complicated way of saying that we can measure the shape of the attractor from the data the shape of the attractor from the simulations and compare them and get a a numerical measure of how good the model looks how good the model performs now the usual way that people currently measure how well models perform would be using quantities like correlation dimension and uh largest Lapinov exponent and what i'm doing in these plots are comparing the information i get from correlation dimension or largest Lapinov exponent the horizontal axis with the conformance measure i just described and the takeaway from these pictures, and more so from these pictures, is that there's very little agreement between these two measures. If these two things were measuring the same sort of thing, then I would expect my clouds of points to be arranged along the identity line. The reason they're not is because conformance is measuring a global topological property of the large scale features of the system. Correlation dimension is measuring scaling at the smaller scales. Not, not experts measuring something else again. So what this tells us is only that these three measures are good in different ways at measuring structural features of the data. And although I don't have time to go on from this point here, um, we applied this conformance measure to evaluate which models are performing well. 
and which models we would like best to use for particular applications. So that brings me to um, the next and main part of the talk that I want to cover. And I'm going to um, be a little bit selective in what I present to you here, because I want to get to some of the applications that we've worked on with the um, maintenance, maintenance ITTC, so the, the transformation of maintenance through data science. Um, and one of the techniques we've been using there is a machine learning paradigm called reservoir computing. And the essence of reservoir computing is that we have some pattern generator, some sequence of neurons that are connected in some pattern. That pattern connection of neurons can in essence be random. Um, we don't care about fitting those neurons in some complicated way. This is not like deep learning where we're trying to achieve a optimal set of connections. We just doing it randomly in a clever way but randomly and we drive that pool of neurons and pool being the the hook for the, the name reservoir computing we drive that pool of neurons with our input the neurons generates patterns and we read out those patterns at the other side by a regularized linear observation layer which is essentially the, the output for the is, is where the fitting goes on. The only fitting we do is at the output layer. It's all linear plus regularization. Um, one way to think about this, and one of the original motivations of reservoir computing, also by the name liquid state machines, was that people previously demonstrated these ideas in an actual, literal, physical reservoir, physical bucket of water. So you have a bucket of water, you, um, your input signal is a probe that's vibrating, generating wave patterns on the surface of the water. You have a camera that is measuring those wave patterns and digitally using that to as a functional approximation. So the basic idea is anything that generates patterns can be used to generate terms that we're gonna try and fit in the model. Obviously, there's a bit more to it than that. There's clever ways of doing this and less clever ways of doing it. Um, the, the formulation here is just, um, well, let me just skip over the formulation, actually go on to one of the ways that we've experimented with reservoirs is using a swarm, like a bunch of interacting birds, computational birds as um, a reservoir. So we have a flock of birds. Those are the blue dots. They are interacting with each other, moving around in a cloud. They have some rules that means that they try to go in the same direction, but not too much, try to go in the same speed, but not too close together, and try to avoid the predator, which is the red dot. So you've got a, a flock of starlings and a hungry hawk, and the hawk is actually the, the system that you're trying to model, right? So that's the drive signal that's driving the reservoir. And by looking at the reactions of the pigeons, the blue dots to the movement of the red dot, we try to build a model to predict what the red dot is going to do in the future. Now, it's not that we believe that the blue dots somehow know about the future. It's simply that the blue dots are offering many different alternative representations of the current state and some combination of those current state observations allows us to make a good prediction of the future this is the same picture just shown as a um, density function rather than as a set of trajectories so here we've got individual trajectories here we've got the density over many simulations of where the birds actually are for a given drive signal so we can do that um, we have to add an extra complication to it. And given that we're driving it with, in this case, a nice chaotic system, we generate a swarm with this complicated behavior and we make a prediction. The prediction here is not great. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for this, which I will probably like to go into later on, but essentially the prediction is the red line and the truth is the black line. So it's uh, not awful, but it's certainly not capturing the dynamics as well as we would like. The main reason for this 
is that there is an issue, and this is technical issue with the identifiability of the individual birds in the flock, in that they can they can switch positions and you can't tell that tell them apart. Um, and the way in which we get around that so far is with the observation layer. It's a work in progress, and we're still currently working on better ways of doing this. But um, it leads me to the the last part of my talk, where I'm going to introduce sets of methods based on the idea of reservoir computing that we are using to learn something about the underlying system. So whereas when I was talking about um, topological data analysis and homology, we were trying to assess the performance of a model for simulation, here we are now using the, the reservoir model of the time series to get indicators of the system performance. So specifically in the case of uh, data from a maintenance process, these indicators of system performance is whether that component is likely to fail and need maintenance. In general, these could be measures of whether a system is about to undergo a regime change from one set of, one set of behavior to a different set of behavior. These could be parameters of the system in the case of either a physical system which has got changing parameters or bifurcation of a idealized model. But in all cases, the, the idea is basically the same. We've got true time series data and we are gonna use that to drive a reservoir, not the bird swarm reservoir because we're still having trouble training the birds getting them to do what we want them to do, um, but a more traditional reservoir computing approach. So the advantages of this more traditional reservoir computing approach is that we know how to make good choices of the reservoir. I said the reservoir is chosen randomly, but it's chosen randomly in a constrained way. Um, technically, it's to do with the, um, well, we make sure that the reservoir is just connected enough so that its behavior has both a high level of novelty and a high level of memory of the true, true behavior. So the first thing I'm going to show you is um, we, again, take the same sort of reservoirs before. So we have a ser an input signal, which can be, which is here U. We feed that into the reservoir, filtered through some input matrix, the VIK, that then is fed into each of the nodes in the reservoir, that are the XIs, going through a hyperbolic activation function. Each of those nodes has its own state, that's XI here, and is impacted by all the other states potentially through the coupling, WIJ, plus some offset, BI. And that reservoir stage just iterates itself. So the XIT gives me XIT plus one, which gives me the next XIT, all the while being driven by the UKTs as well. Okay, so in that, the WIJs are all random, the VIKs are all random, and the BIs are all random. However, random in a good way. We then try to match the behavior of those neurons, the XITs, to our desired target function, the W, the output, the thing that we're trying to actually model. And we do that with a linear fit with regularization of the weights Ri. Okay. However, all of this works because the reservoir is generating interesting patterns, interesting patterns for prediction. So the question now is, can we use those interesting patterns for something other than prediction of the dynamics? So can we use them for understanding the parameters of the system? So we are seeking out to some function of the reservoir states 
This is so G is just my transformation of the current state of the reservoir into something else. So some deterministic function. It could be the mean, the mean of all the exits, the mean of all the states. Probably won't be, could be something else. And the question is, how do we go about making good choices of G so that these Gs are measuring useful discriminating features of the underlying system? So we've done a few experiments on this and um, here I'm going through a bunch of different options for potential Gs. So down the bottom in yellow, the mean of the signal, the variance of the signal, that's just the mean and variance of the input, the UKs. Could nothing to do with the reservoir at all. The purple properties are things that also don't depend on the reservoir, but things that we might be interested in estimating if we're coming from nonlinear time series background. So power spectrum, um, properties of the embedding of the data and recurrence quantification. These are various tools that exist in the literature that are popularly applied to deterministic signals like this. Or we have in cyan at the top three rather simple functions of the reservoir itself. Okay, so what we do with all of this is that um, here, big is good, small is bad. We're looking at how accurately each of these measures are at detecting a change. So I'm looking for a tipping point in my signal. At first, it's just a change in the mean. And not surprisingly, by looking at the mean, the yellow diamonds, I can detect a change in the mean. By looking at the variance, I can't. Versus on the second plot, if I'm looking for change in the variance, then change in the variance. Just looking at the variance does well, looking at the mean does not. Bear with me. That's not surprising. What's more surprising is if I go from, for less obvious changes, either transitions from one category regime to another in a test system, or transitions from one signal to a randomized version of that signal, which lacks structure, what you see in each of these plots, which I'm rushing through very quickly, because I've got to get to the maintenance part so that um, Andrew can tick off the KPI for Natasha, um, is that these, the measures that perform well, as well as the other measures or better, are the measures based on the reservoir. So this is surprising that the reservoir does so well compared to the purple measures, because the purple measures have actually been hand tuned to do exactly this task. Whereas the cyan measures, the ones that I'm plucking out of the reservoir, are more or less random choices from the reservoir itself. Okay, so just finally to finish, um, we can apply the same sort of idea, but instead of using it to predict regime change, which is what we're talking about there, tipping points, we can use it to try to estimate meaningful parameters of the operation of industrial equipment. So the application here is to the um, operation of a um, of an industrial pump. Um, that's just the data. Let me show you the actual application. So what I'm doing here is the same sort of trick, estimating from the reservoir my parameter, which is the degree to which the pump is cavitating. And you can see with different re representations based on embedding um, another auditory based embedding or the echo state network we get. Now, I'm claiming that the, the crosses, which are the correspondence between the actual value I'm trying to predict and the value that I'm getting out of the time series are very close to lying on the black line for an industrial application. Right? The, the fact that the crosses go up at all is fantastic. It gives us a way of quantifying how close this thing is to failure and remember, we're doing this from data that is extracted in an industrial setting from, from this particular industrial pump. Okay, um, I did promise to finish early enough to allow time for questions. I did rush through an awful lot of stuff and I was a little bit more ambitious than I thought I was in what I wanted to cover. So hopefully I have left lots of things unanswered which will lead to lots of questions. And I will just finish by pushing up the, the various publications that are what I talked about as a basis for this talk. 
and we'll ask if there's any questions from the audience, please. <laughs> 